Boa tarde a todos e todas que estão nos assistindo nas diferentes plataformas de transmissão. É um grande prazer tê-los conosco. Sou a Helene Cono, secretária executiva na UFABC e serei a mestre de cerimônias nessa sessão de abertura. O Simpósio Brasileiro de Sistema de Informação, SBSI, é o um encontro anual da Comunidade de Sistema de Informação da Sociedade Brasileira de Computação, SBC, constituindo-se um evento para apresentação de trabalhos científicos e discussão de temas contemporâneos, aproximando estudantes, pesquisadores, profissionais e empresários da Comunidade de Sistema de Informação. O evento congrega palestras, workshops, minicursos, masterclasses, a já conhecida trilha principal com trabalhos de alto impacto na área e de maneira inédita o Tech Day, evento para ser um elo entre a indústria e a pesquisa. Esta será a 16ª edição do SBSI em um formato diferente, que por um lado busca atender as recomendações sanitárias locais, mas por outro, também pretende continuar a história de um dos maiores eventos do país. Eventos representam espaços para ampla discussão de projetos e trabalhos, mas também locais de confraternização e socialização. Com certeza, grandes trabalhos surgiram no Restaurante do Lago em 2018, no Pitu e Pirão em 2019, ou até mesmo nas sessões de Coffee Break. Entretanto, as graves consequências da Covid-19 têm transformado estes espaços que agora acontecem no âmbito virtual, digital. Por sinal, a temática do SBS 2020, coincidentemente ou não, está totalmente relacionada a essa situação, o impacto dos sistemas de informação na transformação e inovação digital. O objetivo da coordenação do SBS 2020 foi transformar para melhor, com novas alternativas tecnológicas, mas mantendo o já reconhecido alto nível e qualidade do SBSI. Essa edição é organizada pelo Centro de Matemática, Computação e Cognição, CNCC, da Universidade Federal da BC, UFABC em parceria com o Núcleo Estratégico de Universos Virtuais, Entretenimento e Mobilidade, também da UFABC. A coordenação geral do evento está sob responsabilidade do professor doutor Flávio Orita e do professor doutor Carlos Alberto Kaminski, ambos professores da UFABC. Mesmo eventos virtuais demandam recursos financeiros e apoios institucionais para viabilizar a sua realização. Nesse sentido, o SBS 2020 agradece imensamente pelos apoios da DECA Consultoria, For Linux, CNPq, CAPES, FAPESP, Acespro, Brascom, Seitec e Prefeitura de São Bernardo do Campo, pois sem eles a realização do evento não seria possível. Ainda mais importante, agradecemos pelo empenho, dedicação, esforço e compromisso de todos os envolvidos na organização do evento, colaboradores, revisores e voluntários. Esse grupo de pessoas também está sendo fundamental para organizar a condução do simpósio, ainda mais diante dos percalços ao longo do ano. Muito obrigada a vocês. Dando início à abertura oficial do SBS 2020, temos a presença do professor doutor Flávio Orita, o FABC, coordenador geral e anfitrião do evento, o professor doutor Marcelo Reis, diretor do CMCC, representando a UFABC, a ilustre presença do professor doutor Raimundo Macedo, da Universidade Federal da Bahia, presidente da SBC, a professora doutora Sheila Ávila e Silva, da Universidade de Caxias do Sul, a professora doutora Andéria Magalhães, da Universidade Federal Fluminense, coordenadoras do programa do SBSI 2020, e o professor doutor Rodrigo Santos, da Universidade do Estado do Rio de Janeiro, coordenador da Comissão Especial em Sistemas de Informação, SESI. Neste momento, convidamos o professor 
Flávio Orita para dar as boas-vindas. Ele é o coordenador geral do SBSI 2020. Boa tarde, pessoal. É um grande prazer estar aqui com vocês. É, queria contar um pouco da história, né, do, de como a gente chegou nesse evento, bem brevemente. É, nós tivemos aí duas fases distintas, né? Nós tivemos aí a, 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 o planejamento em, 2000, é, em 2019, durante o SBS em Aracaju. E de antemão já agradeço aí a, a, o aceite do Carlos quando eu fiz a, o convite para nós podermos sediar é, esse evento na UFBC em 2020, né? nesse ano de 2020. Fizemos todos os planejamentos, é, organizamos todo o evento, mas em março é, fomos atingidos aí pela pandemia da Covid-19, é, um, um fenômeno aí, né, uma pandemia que está se estendendo até os dias atuais, é, e tivemos que mudar, né? foram várias, várias alterações ao longo desses últimos seis meses, nos últimos cinco, seis meses, é, mas... É, a gente conseguiu pensar, durante todas as discussões, pensarmos, pensamos em trazer assim um evento de qualidade, sempre mantendo né é, tudo que o SBSI tem construído aí ao longo dos últimos 16 anos, né, nas suas últimas 16 edições. É, eu não vou é, alongar muito, né eu não vou me alongar muito, mas o que eu queria é, resumir nessa apresentação, nessa sessão de abertura, é basicamente agradecer, né? agradecer todas as pessoas e instituições que, é, mesmo nesse ano de 2020 tão complexo, com tantas dificuldades, nós conseguimos é, trazer, tentar trazermos aqui é, um evento de grande qualidade. tá? É, eu agradeço principalmente a SESI, né? que aceitou, né? me aceitou, aceitou a nossa proposta né? da UFBC para sediar o evento, a UFBC em si, por disponibilizar toda a infraestrutura de pessoal, de espaço, é, agora, no formato virtual, continuou é, fornecendo todo o suporte, e claro, a SBC pela, pela promoção e pela possibilidade de também fazer o evento. É, não poderia deixar de agradecer também todas as pessoas, e eu coloquei em especial a foto da Mirta Veneiro, né? ela é uma professora da UFBC que, infelizmente, ela veio a falecer, em novembro do ano passado, ela fazia parte da comissão de organização, é, junto com a professora Renata, no FESI, e ela representa, assim, muito, é, das, muitas das pessoas que fazem parte do SBSI. Ela, ela foi uma pessoa coordenadora, né? Ela foi revisora de artigos, ela publicou no SBSI, ela não foi panelista e palestrante, mas ela participou, de uma maneira geral, do evento como um todo, né? E também, por fim, não teria como deixar de agradecer os nossos financiadores, né? A DECA, a DECA, a For Linux e também as nossas agências de fomento, a CAPES, o CNBQ e a FAPESP. É, por fim, para concluir a minha fala, eu também não posso deixar de agradecer a todos os participantes, né? Nós temos, é, pela consulta que eu, foi feita hoje de manhã, nós tínhamos em torno de 178 inscritos pagos no evento, é, é um número expressivo, mesmo nesse momento de pandemia. É, e o que eu acho interessante de ressaltar é que nós temos representantes de, da grande maioria dos estados do Brasil, né? é, com exceção do, de Roraima e do Espírito Santo. É, os outros estados estão todos representados aqui né, durante os nossos quatro dias de eventos. Tá? É, claro, destaque para a região sul e sudeste, é, e temos representantes de todas as regiões de uma certa maneira, tá? Então, assim, como organizador, eu queria agradecer muito a presença de todos vocês, a participação de todos vocês é, durante esses quatro dias do evento, tá? E é isso, agradeço muito e volto a fala para a Elaine. Obrigada, Obrigada, professor Flávio. Flávio. Eu convido agora o professor doutor Marcelo Reis, diretor do CMCC, o FABC. Boa tarde a todas e todos, espero que vocês e suas pessoa, as pessoas próximas de vocês estejam bem. Eu agradeço aos organizadores pelo convite e a oportunidade de dizer algumas palavras aqui na abertura. E já os parabenizo pela organização desse evento, professor Flávio Orita, professor Carlos Kaminski e a comissão local, 
né, pela disposição em organizar um evento, sabemos que isso não é trivial, né, isso não é fácil, ainda mais quando saímos da nossa zona de conforto aí num evento remoto. É, agradeço também a Sociedade Brasileira de Computação, né, em nome do seu presidente, presente aqui, professor Raimundo Araújo Macedo, pelo apoio ao evento e por confiar a organização aos nossos docentes. Como diretor do Centro de Matemática, Computação e Cognição, me sinto orgulhoso por sediar esse evento, ainda que de forma virtual. Né? Gostaríamos muito de receber vocês em nossa casa, mas infelizmente as circunstâncias impostas pela pandemia nesse momento nos impedem né, de realizar isso de maneira virtual. Desejamos que isso aconteça num futuro próximo, de preferência, né? No entanto, acredito que a realização de eventos de forma remota apresenta também oportunidades não é? interessantes, pois a gente consegue transcender as barreiras impostas pela distância, pela distância física. É? Pessoas que muitas vezes não poderiam participar do evento por estarem muito distantes, numa situação de, é, mais apressada, etc., podem é, conseguir fazer alguma participação. Então, estamos todos nos adaptando né, a essas novas circunstâncias e aproveitando também as oportunidades que elas proporcionam. Como eu disse antes, a UFBC gostaria muito né, de recebê-los presencialmente. A nossa universidade é uma universidade muito jovem, né? ela foi criada em 2005, e ela tem uma configuração um pouco diferente das universidades mais tradicionais, né, que é onde, além do tripé universitário usual de ensino, pesquisa e extensão, né? Temos também eh, as diretrizes acadêmicas da interdisciplinaridade, da excelência e da inclusão. Né? A interdisciplinaridade também se reflete até, reflete até mesmo na estrutura administrativa da nossa universidade, que aboliu a estrutura de departamentos. Né? Então, o nosso centro, vocês podem ver até pelo título do nosso centro, que é o Centro de Matemática, Computação e Cognição, né? ela é a menor estrutura administrativa da nossa universidade. E a ideia por trás desse modelo é buscar um fluxo maior de ideias entre os diferentes campos do conhecimento na construção de projetos que abordem os grandes desafios da humanidade. Né? E nesse contexto, os desafios e também as oportunidades apresentados pelo recente desenvolvimento das tecnologias computacionais são enormes. Né? Dominar o conhecimento de ponta sobre o desenvolvimento de sistemas de informação atuais, que atendam às necessidades humanas, sejam de produtividade, conhecimento e até mesmo de segurança, né? é fundamental para o futuro do nosso país e para o nosso desenvolvimento como humanos. Né? Então, por isso, por essa razão, tenho muita satisfação de ter essa nossos docentes ajudando aqui na organização desse evento e desejar a todos um excelente simpósio. Obrigado. Obrigada, professor Marcelo. Convidamos agora o professor doutor Raimundo Macedo, da Universidade Federal da Bahia, presidente da SBC. É, boa tarde a todas e todas. É, inicialmente, queria cumprimentar os, o Flávio, o professor Flávio Rita e o professor Carlos Kaminski, através dos quais eu cumprimento todos os organizadores da Universidade Federal do ABC, é, nesse evento, nessa abertura do Simpósio Brasileiro de Sistema de Informação. Queria também aqui é, expressar nossas condolências com as perdas de vidas humanas nessa tragédia que foi a pandemia da Covid-19, hoje com mais de 60, 160 mil mortos e, e vítimas. Né? Então, a nossa, nossa solidariedade aos familiares, amigos, todas essas pessoas que foram vitimadas por essa terrível pandemia. Então, a Sociedade Brasileira de Computação, ela, como vocês sabem, ela, ela é organizada em torno de 27 comissões especiais temáticas, dentro delas tem a Comissão de Sistema de Informação. É uma comunidade muito, muito aguerrida, muito ativa, pujante, já com 16 eventos realizados, simpósios nacionais, e agora na Universidade Federal do ABC, é, ve, vemos pela programação, inclusive o tema escolhido, bastante pertinente, né, de transformação e inovação digital. E, obviamente, que o sistema de formação tem uma importância é, fundamental, 
em todo o processo né, da, da computação, é, na, tanto na automação corporativa como na automação industrial. Agora, com a indústria 4.0, a gente vê também a grande importância de conectar as fábricas com os outros sistemas de automação e o sistema de informação está no centro dessa, dessa mediação, digamos assim, tecnológica. Não é? Então, é importantíssimo o tema. Então, eu congratulo a todos e todas pela, essa, pelo empreendimento, é, expressando aí um desejo de que vocês tenham pleno êxito e sucesso. Vemos aí muitas pessoas participando em todo o Brasil. Eu tenho certeza que será um, um evento coroado de muita, muitas discussões produtivas para a nossa comunidade de sistema de informação e para a SBC em geral. E, por último, queria aqui parabenizar o pessoal do AFABC por ter acolhido também o nosso, nosso simpósio. É, gosto de, da organização da Federal do ABC nas, nos seus centros interdisciplinares. Isso favorece muito a, a interlocução e o diálogo da computação com as demais áreas. Então, só tem a, a trazer benefícios para toda a comunidade de computação. Então, muito agradecido pelo, por estar aqui com vocês também. Parabéns aos organizadores, programas, participantes, autores, todos vocês que estão engajados nesse processo do Simpósio Brasileiro de Sistema de Formação de 2020. Um grande abraço a todos e todas. Obrigada, professor Raimundo. Convidamos agora o professor doutor Rodrigo Santos, da Unirio, coordenador da Comissão Especial de Sistema e Informação. Muito obrigado, pessoal. É, agradeço desde já. Né? Vou começar agradecendo ao professor Flávio, ao professor Carlos, pelo empenho na organização desse evento. Né? Como o professor Raimundo bem disse, né? a SBC tem enfrentado vários desafios esse ano, porque há vários eventos, várias comissões a serem gerenciadas. Então, antes de mais nada, eu gostaria de parabenizar por ver esse belíssimo SBSI com representação de todo o Brasil, com diversas sessões e atividades para a gente é, acompanhar durante a semana. Então, gostaria também de cumprimentar o professor Marcelo, diretor do CCMCC da UFABC, as coordenadoras de programa do SBSI 2020, professora André e professora Sheila. Né? É, eu gostaria de dizer umas poucas palavras sobre a Comissão Especial de Sistemas de Informação, que é uma das comissões mais jovens da SBC. É, nesse sentido, aqui está a composição, né? o comitê gestor ele normalmente é renovado a cada ano, 2019, 2020, existia toda essa composição dos 13 membros, a gente tem não só as pessoas que organizam o evento, como também os editores da revista, eu tive o professor Macedo recentemente pela ISIS, né estou acumulando uma função como editor também do nosso periódico. É, e, realmente, com a pandemia atual da comunidade, que normalmente é quando acontece o simpósio, é, e nós mantivemos, né após uma apreciação da comunidade, a comissão, agregando o professor Rafael Araújo, da Universidade Federal de Uberlândia, que sediará o SBSC 2021. É, alguma comunidade que acho que é importante, é muito trabalho que acontece nos bastidores, mesmo no período pandêmico também, é, isso persistiu aqui na nossa comissão, né? nós tivemos a criação... Olá pessoal, então eu vou, acho que acho que o Rodrigo caiu, né, eu vou assumir por aqui, né, uh, eu sou o professor Davi Viana, vice-coordenador, né, da Comissão Especial em Sistemas de Informação. Oi Rodrigo, voltou? Voltei, na verdade acho que aconteceu a mesma coisa do CBSoft, né, <risos> na semana de abertura, quando a, Tayana, quando a professora Tayana foi falar, <risos> aconteceu a mesma coisa, mas vamos lá. É, bom, pessoal, então, falando de algumas ações aqui, agradeço também ao meu parceiro, professor da Viviana da UFMA, que é o vice-coordenador da Comissão Especial. Nós criamos o Comitê é, Diretivo da SBSI para apoiar é, a evolução do evento e a manutenção de suas ações para o futuro, para que a SESI possa focar mais nas questões estratégicas. Também temos dado continuidade à questão dos anais principais estendidos né, na, da, na Biblioteca Sol da SBC, o novo portal de periódicos e eventos. É, também atualizamos as redes sociais com o apoio do professor Flávio, né? a gente listou algumas delas, e também temos um grupo agora de WhatsApp da comunidade de SI para aproximar cada vez mais o nosso diálogo. 
É, apoiamos aí a questão dos eventos científicos nesse momento. É, há também outros eventos, além do SBSI, como as escolas regionais de sistemas de informação, que a gente tem dado suporte. E, por fim, é, estivemos à frente aí de reconhecer os veículos da nossa área de SI, que se caracteriza pelo tripé pessoas, processos e organizações e tecnologias. Né? Acho que toda pesquisa que a gente quer apresentar aqui tem que lidar um pouquinho com essas dimensões, muito embora muitas dessas pesquisas sejam feitas em áreas específicas da computação. Mas o que a gente pensa muito no simpósio de sistemas de informação é na congregação dessas dimensões. Então, com isso que eu faço minha fala, gostaria de agradecer bastante, novamente, aos coordenadores, desejar um sucesso aí para toda a comunidade, que aprendam bastante durante essa semana, um forte abraço né, nesse, nessa missão de consolidar a área de SI, de caracterizar o que é a pesquisa em SI no Brasil. Convido a todos para, na sexta-feira, estarem conosco, às 18h30, na Sala Santo André, essa mesma sala aqui, é, para a nossa reunião integrada, né, reunião conjunta, a comissão especial com a comunidade, para a gente apreciar alguns pontos né, e fazer um reporte mais detalhado do que aconteceu esse ano. Então, bem-vindos e bom evento a todos. Obrigada, professor Rodrigo. Convido agora a professora doutora Sheila Ávila, da Universidade de Caxias do Sul, e a professora doutora Andréia Magalhães, da Universidade Federal Fluminense, coordenadoras de programa do SBSI 2020. Obrigada, Elaine. Bom, boa tarde a todos. É, em nome da comissão de organização aí do SBSI 2020, eu e a professora Sheila queremos comentar com vocês um pouquinho do que, que a gente tem de programação para esse ano, para o nosso evento virtual. Então, dessa vez, nós vamos ter quatro dias de evento. Então, começando hoje até sexta-feira, a gente vai estar reunido. São 12 sessões técnicas acontecendo em paralelo aí para a gente estar tá assistindo, distribuído ao longo desses dias. A gente tem um total de 47 artigos sendo apresentados dos 203 trabalhos que foram submetidos esse ano para o SBSI. É, a nossa programação tem ainda alguns destaques. A gente tem dois keynotes internacionais, um deles já acontece hoje. É, a gente tem também duas masterclass e dois minicursos, então a gente vai ter a oportunidade aí de estar tá combinando aspectos teóricos e práticos nessa programação do evento, atendendo um pouco até de um ensejo da comunidade que já tinha sido colocado na reunião da comunidade do evento do ano passado. Gostaria de Fica concurso de teses e dissertações de conclusão de curso. A gente tem o Waze, que é o um encontro de inovação, que é um espaço que a gente tem treinado é para inovadorismo, educação na área de sistemas de informação. A gente tem um workshop em pesquisa de sistemas de informação, ainda que é a competição no desenvolvimento de sistemas de informação. Então, a programação está bastante, a gente conseguiu contemplar diferentes aspectos. Todos esses eventos né, vão contar com a Pode passar. Então, esses são os nossos dois que a gente tem, o Keynote do Alan, que é a oportunidade ímpar, única da gente estar em Design Science. A gente tem também o Keynote do Guilherme Rogueira, falando do tema, né, que é a base para a gente no SBS e tal, que também ninguém perder. E a gente tem duas masterclasses, uma focando no tem sistemas de informação e a segunda é abordando tanto a teoria quanto os sociais em sistemas de informação, tá? É... Pode passar? 
Bom, além disso, né, aproveito para agradecer a todos os coordenadores é, dos eventos satélites. Né? Então, uh, da UAC. a gente tem o Waze, o Encontro de Lomão, que vai estar acontecendo na Cegueira, por Deve Azevedo e pelo Vladimir. Pode passar. A gente tem também o concurso de teses e dissertações em sistemas de informação e o concurso de trabalhos de conclusão de curso. Eu agradeço aos professores Rita, Suzana e Marcelo Fentinato. Agradeço também aos professores Clodes e Carlos, que estão organizando o workshop de teses e dissertações em sistemas de informação, que vai acontecer na sexta-feira também. Pode passar. Bom, a professora Andréia acho que falhou um pouquinho, né? Então, eu continuo com, com a apresentação. Aqui nós, nós estamos vendo, só um minutinho, nós continuamos com a programação, falando do workshop de iniciação, uh, do workshop de iniciação científica em sistemas de informação, que foi coordenado pelo professor Luiz Ribeiro e pelo professor... Uh, Denis Fantinato, da UFABC, agradecemos, então, a contribuição de todos. O evento acontece dia 4 de novembro, amanhã. E, por fim, então, a competição de desenvolvimento de sistemas de informação inovadores, que acontece no dia 6 de novembro, sob a coordenação do professor Fábio Rocha e do professor Tiago uh, Covões, também, da UFABC. Por fim, né, nós temos então alguns outros eventos que fazem uh, engrandecer o nosso SBSI, que é o Fórum de Educação e Sistemas de Informação, coordenado pela professora Renata Araújo e pela professora Mirta Venero, né, em memória. Então, agradecer a contribuição por pensar a graduação e a pós-graduação em sistemas de informação no nosso país. O Tech Day, que é o, o primeiro uh, evento satélite relacionado a unir, então, a academia com a área empresarial, coordenado também pela professora Renata Araújo e pelo professor Márcio Oikawa, também da UFABC. E, por fim, né, pensando na qualidade em sistemas de informação, tratamos do workshop de pesquisa em sistemas de informação, um painel que ocorre dia 4 de novembro com o professor Cian Siqueira, da Unirio. Obrigada, professora Andréia. Obrigada, professora Sheila. Agora eu convido novamente o professor doutor Flávio Orita para apresentar os últimos detalhes sobre o evento. Bom, minha fala vai ser mais breve agora. É, falando um pouco sobre como nós organizamos o SBSI, a gente vai ter, então, as sessões técnicas, como a Andréia e a Sheila já passaram, elas serão transmitidas pela plataforma Zoom. É, os links foram encaminhados é, por e-mail, mas devido a alguns problemas técnicos na, nesta primeira sessão, possivelmente alguns deles é, terão que ser alterados. Então, eu convido vocês a sempre estarem prestando atenção é, dentro do Discord, é, para estar tá acompanhando aí quais serão os últimos links. Tá? Eu já falei do Discord, o Discord então, vai ser a nossa plataforma de interação é, interação social, vamos dizer assim, dentro do SBSI, tá? É, a gente organizou a plataforma em categorias por dias, então vocês vão conseguir ver que lá dentro do Discord nós temos os quatro dias agrupando ah, as diferentes sessões, e em cada dia, lógico, nós temos cada uma dessas sessões, tá? É, eu convido vocês também a dar uma, darem uma olhada na categoria Café com Sistemas, tá? Que é uma categoria onde a gente colocou canais é, de áudio, onde as pessoas podem, os participantes podem entrar ali dentro daquele canal é, e podem interagir com as pessoas, seja por vídeo ou seja por é, texto mesmo escrito, ou por é, vídeo ou áudio falado. É, então, é uma ótima oportunidade para vocês estarem interagindo 
também dentro do evento. Tá? É, os anais do SBSI da CM já estão liberados. É bem possível que hoje é, o PDF de todos os artigos já estejam publicados. Os anais da SOL, que são dos outros eventos, os anais estendidos, eles serão liberados ao longo da semana. Tá? Eles estão em processo aí de finalização, de edição é, dos textos iniciais, tá? é, dos textos de abertura. É, então, eles estarão disponíveis aí, possivelmente até o final é, da semana, até o final do evento. É, eu convido todo mundo a também interagir dentro da, das redes, nossas redes sociais, o SBS Brasil, arroba SBS Brasil, ele está tanto no Instagram quanto no YouTube, no, desculpa, no Twitter e no Facebook. Então, vocês podem marcar é, o perfil do, do SBSI é, nas, nas redes sociais, compartilhar as fotos, é, compartilhar é, o que está tá acontecendo. Né? Acho que essa é uma grande oportunidade para mostrar aí a força também da nossa comunidade dentro do Brasil. Além dos canais uh, das mídias sociais, a gente convida vocês também a, utilizaram as hashtag, a utilizarem as hashtags. Tá? Nós criamos, em particular, três hashtags para serem utilizadas. É, hashtag SBSI 2020, é, hashtag é, Acontece SBSI 2020 e é, a Venha do SBSI 2020. Então, fiquem à vontade para utilizar essas hashtags também nas mídias sociais. É, novamente, para a gente tentar mostrar é, a força da nossa comunidade. Tá? Bom, por fim, eu declaro, então, aberto o nosso 16º SBSI. Desejo a todos uma excelente semana, com grandes discussões, debates, aprendizado contínuo ao longo das sessões, tá? Acho que essa vai ser uma semana bem interessante para nós melhorarmos um pouco aí Uh, o nosso conhecimento na área e nos temas mais modernos e contemporâneos que vão ser debatidos. Tá? É, com isso, agradeço a todos, agradeço a mesa e volto a palavra para a Helene. Obrigada, Obrigada, professor Flávio, Flávio novamente. novamente. E agradeço a todos pela presença e damos por encerrada a abertura oficial do SBSI 2020. Tenha uma ótima semana e um bom evento. Muito obrigada. Olá, pessoal. Estão me ouvindo? Acho que sim, né? É, ao, é, ao, ao, ao moderate the, the next talk, uh, the international uh, keynote, I'll make a short announcement in Portuguese and then I go back to English. So, Uh, pessoal, então eu sou o Gleison Santos, estou aqui para coordenar, moderar, na verdade, a apresentação do nosso Keynote. É, como eu falei aqui no chat, eu vou é, pegar as perguntas pelo Zoom e pelo Discord, por favor, façam perguntas e me digam se querem fazer ao vivo ou querem que eu faça. Se quiserem fazer em português também, eu posso é, traduzir, tá? Então, qualquer coisa, conversa comigo no Discord, que eu estou aqui olhando tudo. So, let's go back to English. Uh, it's an honor, an honor to me to present the, the, the next talk. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, our, final, our first keynote speaker, Professor Hevener, uh, will speak on daring to do good design science research. Professor Hevener is, is a distinguished university professor and eminent scholar in the information system and decision science department in the Muma College of Business at the University of South Florida. He holds the Citigroup Hidden River Chair of Distributed Technology. Dr. Havina's areas of research interest include design science research, information system development, software engineering, distribute, distributed database systems, uh, healthcare systems, and Internet of Things computing. He has published over 250 research papers on these topics and has consulted, has consulted for a number of, of Fortune 500 companies. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Havener, it's a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, please. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, it's, it's my pleasure to uh, address this, uh, this great audience here in, uh, in Brazil. I hope everybody is uh, doing well. I know we've all faced some, some challenges, but, uh, you know, I'm very excited to um, 
acquaint you with uh, design science research uh, if you're new to it. Uh, and we're going to do a little deeper dive if you're familiar with it. And I'm excited uh, to uh, introduce these ideas to you and feel free to engage and send me email uh, and continue the discussion uh, even beyond this conference. So uh, thank you, Gleason, for the introduction. And thank you to uh, 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 Flavio because we've interacted a great deal over the last couple of months to, uh, to make this happen. Okay, well, let me share my screen and we'll, uh, we'll start the uh, discussion here. And feel free to uh, interrupt as, uh, as appropriate if you want me to clarify uh, any of the ideas that I'm covering. So let me just make sure, does everybody uh, see my screen? Yes. Okay. And uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yes, uh, loud and clear. Okay, very good. Okay, well, let me um, get started here. And my talk today is going to be uh, daring you all to do good design science research, because I think it is, it is a daring uh, adventure. Uh, I love this quote by uh, Teddy Roosevelt, um, who basically says, it's not the critic who counts, it's the person in the arena who dares greatly. Um, and this is our challenge, I think, as good design science researchers is to find interesting challenges uh, and to dare greatly to solve those challenges. So good, attempting to do good design science is, is audacious. Uh, it's not a journey for researchers uh, who value optimal repeatable results uh, who want to rely on existing theory, because um, our goal is to solve real world problems. And by doing so, to do rapid cycles of build and evaluate to produce emergent and satisfactory results. Um, it's difficult. There are many challenges, as we'll go through in the presentation today. But I would encourage you to do it because it's fun, it's satisfying, and you are changing the world. So let me begin by just uh, giving you a basic introduction. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but design science is a pragmatic problem solving paradigm. And it is engaged scholarship. Uh, we have a number of stakeholders the researchers, the users, the clients, the sponsors, the practitioners. Uh, and we engage these stakeholders in exciting complex challenges. Um, our projects are typically team-based, longitudinal, goal-driven, and, and we inform multiple audiences. So just a quick background. Um, design throughout history is, uh, you know, has been the way uh, essentially civilization has advanced uh, through many disciplines, engineering, education, uh, architecture, art, music, we all try to engage the roles of creativity, collaboration to improve the world through new designs. Um, more recently, uh, Herbert Simon, Nobel Prize winner, uh, sort of engaged these, this design paradigm in a book that he wrote, a series of lectures uh, and he termed it sciences of the artificial. Uh, and he based this thinking on pragmatism as a philosophy. Uh, and he talked about the creation of innovative artifacts to solve real world problems as the sciences of the artificial. Now, as some co-authors, some colleagues and I engaged this idea of design science in our field of information systems, uh, it resulted in the MISQ paper uh, in uh, 2004, uh, currently has close to 15,000 citations for that paper. Um, then Shirley Greger and I uh, wrote a paper, MISQ, in 2013 that brought together 
the idea of building the artifact and growing design theory around the artifact. Uh, and then a more, somewhat more recent paper, JAIS uh, in 2018, uh, brought together again some, some good colleagues to discuss the balance between that artifact and design theory. Uh, so let me briefly go over those three papers with you, uh, and then we'll get into some more uh, complex ideas. So this is my diagram as to where design science research is. Um, between the fast moving world of technology, which is very rapid, we're coming up with new technologies in the world pretty much every day, continuous improvement, and it's driven by human and economic utilities. Um, excellent uh, discussion in Brian Arthur's book, The Nature of Technology. We as researchers then try to understand this rapid pace of technology and how we apply technology to solve human problems. And we try to build science, the descriptive knowledge, the prescriptive knowledge around the use of this technology. So science evolution, of course, is marked by paradigm shifts, a process driven by the, the scientific uh, process, evaluation, gathering of data, hypothesis testing, uh, and of course the famous book by uh, uh, Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolution. So in my opinion, design science sort of bridges this idea of technology and science and continues this rapid cycle of science informing technology and then technology building new science. So in the 2004 paper, this was, if you will, the, uh, the classic uh, figure where design science research, uh, the relevance is informed by the environment, the people, the organizations, the technology, and the rigor is, uh, brought about by the applicable knowledge of the knowledge, existing knowledge bases, the foundations, the theories, the instruments, uh, and the methods uh, that we use to build and evaluate. So our research then are these rapid design cycles of building an artifact, evaluating it, and then growing design theory around the artifact to the point where we're ready to make two key contributions with our work. We make a contribution into the application environment with our artifact, where we measure the improvement in our environment. But at the same time, we make a contribution into the knowledge base with our emerging, growing design theory as to why the artifact improves the world, solves the uh, problem the, in the way it does, and then how do we evolve that over time? Uh, and in the 2004 paper, we presented guidelines. Uh, we really didn't uh, mean and uh, to, to provide a process here, but these are essentially almost a checklist to say if you're doing good design science research, you've got to attend to these seven guidelines. Uh, quickly, what is your artifact? What are you building? How is your problem relevant? How are you evaluating the effectiveness, the quality of that artifact in context and as theory growth? And again, the two types of research contribution into the real world environment, as well as into the knowledge base. How did you define the evaluation techniques, the building techniques to make your research rigorous? How did you appropriately draw from the knowledge base to ground your research as a rigorous uh, study? Uh, guideline six is important. We know that there are many, many, in fact, maybe even infinite possible design candidates. How did you choose the one you did to build your artifact? So how did you search 
for that most effective artifact to eventually implement uh, in your research project. And finally, how did you communicate your contribution to the multiple stakeholders that are part of your uh, research uh, uh, project? So again, these are essentially just checklists to say, have I covered everything that needs to be done in my project? Then as we move to the 2013 paper that I did with Shirley Greger, um, there was some interesting discussion over the period when the 2004 paper was published to say, uh, you know, what's most important? Is the artifact itself important or is there a need for good design theory surrounding the artifact? Uh, and our argument in this paper is that it depends on the maturity of your problem space, as well as the maturity of your solution space. So in less mature uh, areas, just building the artifact is a research contribution. Uh, as we've said, the first bicycle, the first steam engine, uh, the first decision support system um, is a true research contribution as a situated implementation of the artifact. However, most, uh, most of the problem spaces we deal with are mature enough to say, it's not enough just to build an artifact. We need to generalize our knowledge around that artifact to, as we term, nascent design theory. We need to understand design principles, an architecture, technological rules, methods, models that allow us to generalize that knowledge to a wider application space and even to other interdisciplinary application spaces. And then at the final level three, this is where we would have mid-range theory, where we now have a more mature, sophisticated understanding. Uh, it is maybe not descriptive theory yet, but it applies very generally across a lot of application spaces. And we term that uh, mid-range design theory. And then probably the most uh, uh, referenced uh, diagram in the 2013 paper is, is this figure, which we term the knowledge contribution framework, uh, where again, based upon the maturity of the application area, which is the problem space here, high to low on the x-axis, and the maturity of your solution space, high to low on the y-axis, we can talk about four quadrants of research. If it's a new problem with no, solu probable, no solutions that exist, we would term that the invention quadrant. New solutions, new problems. It's rare that we find opportunities to really invent new solutions for new problems. Most of our research fits into either this quadrant or this quadrant. Uh, improvement basically says we understand the problem, but we don't have really good solutions or we need better solutions for that problem space. So this is where a lot of research and development goes on to say, we have new creative, better ways of solving that problem. The exaption space switches it around. And here is where we have a new problem, but we have some knowledge of other problem spaces where they have mature solutions that we can exact or adapt or adopt into this problem space. Um, just a quick example here, uh, going from say brick and mortar commerce to e-commerce on the internet. Again, we had many existing solutions, but how did that exact? How did those solutions adapt into the new internet space or to the mobile phone space where we now have a new mobile commerce space? So how did previous solutions maybe in e-commerce on the internet apply and adapt into the uh, mobile space? And finally, the quadrant where we understand the problem, we understand existing solutions. We term this routine design. It could be professional consulting. 
uh, it could be best practices. There are opportunities to do research in that space, but not to the level of the space, the other three uh, spaces. Uh, typically, um, entrepreneurship would call this exploitation and the other three spaces exploration uh, in terms of uh, research. Okay, any questions up to this point? I, I don't wanna to go too fast. I know this is uh, new to some of you. So uh, any questions at this point? I think everyone is a little bit shy. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay, well, I'll keep moving then. Um, because at this point, I wanna move into some challenges we face. Uh, as we do good design science research. Um, and I wanna focus on uh, six key challenges. Uh, and in each of these challenges, I'm going to present some um, references of some uh, contributions we've made recently uh, into understanding how to deal with these challenges. So let's start with complexity. Um, as we do good design science research, we study complex socio-technical systems. Uh, a recent paper that I reference here in MISQ uh, says that is the uh, key uh, element of what information systems is all about, is to understand complex socio-technical systems. Uh, from complexity theory, we know complex systems are diverse, interdependent, connected, and adaptive. So how do we manage our complexity by understanding the problem space in a way that allows us to make a contribution in that problem space. Uh, and I would argue we need to understand a number of elements here. Context, what do we mean by goodness? What do we mean by improvement in that space? Uh, and finally, how do we deal with the changes, the dancing landscape we find in these complex systems. Uh, and Simon definitely had something to say here. Um, he basically said that the first step of any good design science project is understanding and representing the problem space uh, to the point where he would claim that if we understand the problem, the solution may even be transparent. So we're challenged to understand the problem in a way that we can bound it, we can understand it, and we can solve a bounded problem in a well-defined approach. Uh, and I, I really like this idea of a dancing landscape in the sense that as we solve a bounded problem in our problem space, we change the problem space, okay? So the next DSR cycle faces a new problem. So the final question, uh, and this is an open question, uh, what does repeatability or reproducibility of research mean in design science? Uh, I, I think we don't fully understand that yet. So let me to tackle a part of that. And that is, what do we mean by goodness? What do we, how do we in our problem space define the goals of our research project, okay? So typically we have multiple uh, objectives or goals. So how do we prioritize and weigh those goals in an overall, if you will, problem utility function? So, you know, when we evaluate whether we've solved the problem, we essentially have to calculate that utility function to say, what is the best design candidate that we want to then build and intervene with in the problem space? So here's just a, a paper that we wrote uh, for uh, Sig Prague in uh, ICIS a couple of years ago in San Francisco. Um, so we're still working on coming up with some of these types of uh, solutions. But let me just show you an initial idea here. Um, if we draw from Maslow's hierarchy of needs and think about what are the goals of solving the problem in our problem space, 
Uh, we would argue that you need to start from the base utilitarian goals. Does it solve the problem? Then once those goals are set, safety, security, privacy, then moving up to interaction, usability, do we satisfy the stakeholders uh, and communicate our solution appropriately? Then cognitive aesthetic goals. Do people want to use it? Is it fun? Uh, you know, is it rational? And then finally, is it new? Are we doing research? Uh, are we making an innovation uh, contribution? Uh, and if we just look at some of the criteria here, we could sort of fill in that matrix um, in a way that says, we can't do all of this, but what is our research about? Is our research fundamentally say about security or is it fundamentally about usability? And if so, how do we sort of fill in the bottom parts of that hierarchy uh, to build a complete uh, function of goals and weights on those goals to decide what is the best artifact to implement and then how do we evaluate the goodness of that artifact? So this is some, some ongoing research that I think is important to understand in a good design science project. Next, let's move to creativity. Uh, I think the essence of all design human progress occurs when creative ideas are realized in design artifacts and markets are formed to produce, trade, and use these artifacts. So how does a good design science research project enable and harness human creativity? Well, I've done some research with some colleagues uh, in the neuroscience space where we try to understand the essence of creativity in coming up with new and better designs. Uh, here's a reference to a paper that uh, appeared a couple years ago. Um, and in the neuro-IS uh, area, we're, we continue to uh, think about this. But take a look at this diagram. Again, you see the problem space and the solution space on the y-axis here. But on the x-axis, we have the external world and the internal cognitive world, what's inside our human minds. So as we understand and model the problem space, we deal with that complexity. And then we say, how do we solve based upon our goal setting? How do we come up with good design candidates? How do we engage creativity to do that? By the way, as well as engaging collaborative because multiple human beings coming together and being creative, uh, you know, and providing good solutions is important in these projects. And then as we create numerous design candidates, how then do we control a process that allows us to identify the one or two that we would implement, evaluate, and then intervene in our external environment. Okay, so I think this is a good way to think through sort of the human cognitive capabilities that we as humans have to be good design uh, builders and evaluators. So through some colleagues that uh, I've worked with in the neuro IS uh, field, uh, We've recently published a paper in uh, the European Journal of uh, Information Systems. And by the way, it has appeared now. Uh, I should update that reference. Um, but we wrote a paper saying, how do we advance the neuro IS research agenda? And the section that I wrote basically is talking about uh, design. And so you can read through these questions, um, but this, establishes a research agenda, if you will, in how we in the design field can appropriately engage as well as use the theories in neuroscience and neuro IS to talk about good design. So you can see some of the questions here. 
you know, how do we balance analytic reasoning and intuitive reasoning? You know, thinking fast, thinking slow. Uh, Kahneman's uh, work in uh, uh, in that in that area. Um, how do we define good design processes to enable human creativity? How do we make up design teams so that we can address issues like trust and diversity and personalities uh, to build good collaborative performance? Um, so I think these are important challenges that we need to understand and address. Uh, finally, as part of this, um, let me say that human values play a role here in all design. Um, designs differ on the way we uh, support, uh, you know, different stakeholders. So we have to balance the different stakeholder needs in these projects. Um, what I'm showing here is a, a little preliminary project. Uh, uh, we have access to some design notebooks of very creative people. Uh, in particular, uh, an architect uh, who was the architect for, this is the uh, Saint, uh, Salvador Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, you can see influences from Buckminster Fuller and uh, I.M. Pei uh, in this building. Uh, we, so his, the architect is Jan Weymouth. Um, uh, we also have uh, design notebooks from a uh, artist uh, Theo Wojcik, who, who is uh, deceased, but um, he was a master printer uh, in, uh, in New York in the 60s. He was a uh, uh, printer to Andy Warhol, uh, and you can see some of his original composition here. Um, so how do these uh, sort of design processes that these very creative people show embody their value systems? Uh, and how do we as creative designers and value uh, embody a value system? Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity to do this type of research. Now, let me move to confidence. How do stakeholders have confidence uh, in our results? Well, I would argue that design science is at heart an evidence-based science. Um, which brings us into the world of big data and data analytics. But confidence in the ability of the design artifact to satisfy our problem uh, is predicated on the rigor of our evaluations and the evidence of have we met the goals that we've set. So I like to view a project in, in this little diagram uh, in that we start with the problem space, we understand the problem, we move to solution space, which says, what potential solutions do we have for, and then how do we appropriately draw from the knowledge base for our build and evaluation activities? Uh, and by, by the way, evaluations in, in, as we go through the design cycles are termed formative evaluations. Then as we intervene and bring our solution back into the problem space, we do what is termed summative evaluation. And there are two types. One is fitness for use. Does it currently solve the problem? And how well does it currently solve the problem? But at the same time, we should be thinking about fitness for evolution. Uh, that gets into the issue of sustainability. Uh, is our solution sustainable over time? over changes in the problem space, okay? We talked about the dancing landscape. Is our solution going to dance along with that dancing landscape, okay? So there are really two types, that, they can be separated. You know, we may have a different measurement of fitness for use and fitness for evolution. The 2004 paper basically presented a toolbox. It's up to us as good researchers to appropriately draw from the knowledge base and use the best evaluation methods we can for our situation, for our environment. And we have a lot to draw from. We have a lot of different types of evaluation techniques, all the way from highly qualitative, observational, descriptive, 
uh, to very uh, rigorous uh, analytical, even to the point of software testing, experimental, controlled experimentation, simulation, um, and you know the, again, the actual testing of say software or other types of very formal logic uh, that we would wanna do here. So how do we appropriately select good evaluation methods? Well, here's just a little algorithm uh, to do that. Uh, and it's not hard and fast. Different researchers will choose different ways of doing their evaluation, but they have to stand behind their evidence. The evidence they bring to, the, to their project uh, has to be justified. And this is what the reviewers of your papers are gonna look at. You know, did you appropriately select your evaluation for your research question, for your goals, for your hypotheses, if you do uh, set up hypotheses for your research question, uh, for your application context, for your data sources, whether they're qualitative, quantitative, primary, secondary, tertiary. Uh, does your team have the appropriate skills to do those types of evaluation? And are you using your instruments, your tools appropriately? And you may have different evaluation methods for your formative versus your summative evaluations. Again, formative being your fast design cycles in your lab, if you will, versus intervening and evaluating the artifact in its true context. And then I mentioned design sustainability. Uh, a couple of years ago, my colleague here at USF, Grandin Gill and I uh, wrote a paper, a little bit philosophical, but talking about uh, the different ways of building fitness utility models, both for existing fitness, as well as for sustainability. So uh, I won't get into that paper. It's a, like I say, it's a little bit philosophical. It draws from both, uh, uh, the physical sciences, as well as economics, to understand how to build these types of multi-criteria uh, utility models. Okay, let me move to control. Um, the process of doing good design science research, um, I, I think, can be a, a little bit open. Uh, it can be agile, in a sense. Uh, there have been some traditional uh, uh, approaches, processes uh, developed. Uh, Jay Nunnermaker's group uh, had an initial one. Uh, Kuchler and Vaishnavi uh, had a process. And then probably the most referenced one is Peffers et al., uh, the DSR methodology. Now, at the same time, we see action research being brought into design projects. And so the Sen et al. paper in MISQ. Uh, talked about action design research process. Okay, this is important. So I worked with uh, one of my doctoral students recently and we tried to apply action design research uh, into a project. Uh, and we found that we needed a little more understanding. So we developed what we termed an elaborated action design research method. Um, and there's the reference. It appeared in European uh, Journal of Information Systems last year. Uh, Matt Malarkey was my uh, colleague. Um, what we felt was we needed to unpack some of the, uh, uh, the model uh, of the uh, ADR. And so we broke it into four cycles. We felt at any point in time, you were either doing a cycle of diagnosis understanding the problem space, design, being creative, and building a new artifact and evaluating it, implementing, which would be intervening in the problem space, or over time evolving that particular solution to make it sustainable with different entry points uh, based upon the current context of our uh, problem, problem space of our, of our uh, project. Now, each of these cycles then can be expanded with five activities. Understanding the problem, forming the problem for that cycle, 
creating the artifact, evaluating the artifact, reflecting on our work in this cycle, building design theory, if you will, and then learning and knowing where our next cycle is going. Now you'll see some principles here, and we drew these principles from the uh, Sen et al. ADR paper, um, but we feel there needed to be more flexibility, more agility in our ability to sort of mix and match these cycles in, in the process. So for example, a project may start out with uh, one or two cycles of diagnosis to build models of the problem space, to understand our goals, to define that utility function. Then we may go to, uh, again, a couple cycles of design, understanding how to you know, build and actually building and evaluating the artifact. Uh, maybe during that time, we have to go back and grow greater understanding of the problem. So maybe more diagnosis cycles. Then at the point when we're ready to intervene, we might move to an implementation cycle. So you can see the sort of flexible interaction and back and forth. So our goal is to say these cycles should be rapid. They should produce artifacts, evaluate them, and then say, okay, do we need to have more design, more diagnosis, are we ready to go to implementation? So just fast cycles in this elaborated EADR process. So take a look at that paper to, uh, I, I think it adds some good, flexible, agile thinking to the, uh, the control. Now, one final comment here, and this was based upon uh, Arun Ray's editorial a couple of years ago in MISQ, March uh, 2017. Uh, I had a small piece of that editorial uh, where I talked about intellectual control of complexity. Uh, let me just make this argument. Uh, it's a little bit controversial. And that is, we deal with complexity of real world problems. And to be realistic, to be relevant, we need to avoid reductionism found in much research that simplifies the problem space to one in which known theories and solutions apply. So I would argue extensive search for applicable theories upon which to ground design and predict behaviors is unlikely to be fruitful in complex system environments. Therefore, it is better for the design team to begin immediately these rapid cycles of building and refining the artifact in a controlled manner, and then growing design theory around the emergent artifact that we're building. So it's a small, it's, it, the paper that I uh, make there is, is a fairly small uh, discussion, but I think it's an important argument that we need to, to make to say we don't need, we shouldn't be, if you will, paralyzed by trying to say we have to have a lot of grounding theory before we start building and evaluating. Sometimes it's better just to start building and evaluating, and then if you will, to backfill the theory that grounds why, how we're doing this building and evaluating. Uh, and watch for that emergent design theory, that emergent understanding of why our artifacts have value. Okay, and finally, let me talk about the contribution a little bit. Uh, I get a lot of questions to say, how do we know we're making a new contribution? Well, I've discussed that through this talk, and that is we make two types of contributions into the real world problem space and growing design theory into the knowledge base. And we make those contributions at different levels of maturity based upon the maturity of our problem space and our solution space. So in the 2013 paper, Shirley and I argued there are basic two types of knowledge. There may be others, but these are the two ones that are dominant, if you will. And that is descriptive knowledge of the, of the real world, we understand phenomenon, we make sense of those phenomenon, and prescriptive knowledge in which we try to improve the world by adding new design artifacts and new design theory. So 
So this is a, a, a diagram that I did with, a, again, a colleague, Andreas Drexler. We presented this at Desrist uh, in India in uh, 2018. Uh, we're currently uh, expanding this to a journal. Um, but I think this is an important understanding of the different types of knowledge that we both consume and produce in our projects. So here are our projects. You've seen this before, problem space, solution space, uh, summative evaluations. And as we perform our project, we draw both from descriptive knowledge as grounding theory of the, how the real world works, and we draw from prescriptive knowledge, both from desi emerging design theory that currently exists, as well as current design artifacts that exist. So that's one, three, and five. And then our project should make new contributions to knowledge, producing new knowledge in terms of new artifacts, new entities, new growing design theories or expanded design theories, and perhaps not necessarily even new extension and expansion of descriptive knowledge, natural theory here. So we should keep in mind the types of contributions we're making with our project is both design artifacts, design theory, and descriptive theory if we're extending how our design artifact is being used appropriately in real world contexts. Um, and then the 2018 paper I mentioned that was in JAIS, we talked about the different impacts that uh, DSR makes. And we have many. Um, we hopefully our projects change and improve the human condition in terms of the artifacts are the vehicle for the dissemination of knowledge. The idea of the artifact, the, create, the creativity embedded in the artifact and our design theories that are embodied by the artifact are the new ideas to knowledge. Our practical impacts are the use of the artifact to provide evolving new innovative solutions. Okay, so our research impacts are the dissemination of these ideas and theories. Now, one of our goals here is to create these knowledge bases so they can be used appropriately by future projects. And we term that the accumulation and evolution of design knowledge. And this is a paper again that has just appeared uh, as well as a special issue uh, in JAIS, again, it has appeared uh, recently. So we had an editorial, which is this here with my colleagues, Jan von Bruck, Robert Winter, and Alex Making. Um, and our argument is, I think, pretty standard. The fact that we can't just do one-off projects. We've got to build on what other people have already done. And as we publish our results, we wanna be able to publish results and then build on those results as we move forward uh, in our projects. So there's a challenges here is that we're missing these opportunities to produce reusable design knowledge, to consume and compose design knowledge contributions, and then understand what the current validity of design knowledge is and update it appropriately. So let me address that. We, in this paper, talked about a map of design knowledge based upon three dimensions. And so the problem space dimension is how general, how projectable is the knowledge we've generated in our project, low, medium, high. Second, in the solution space, how fit is our solution? How well have we uh, satisfied the goals that we've set. Now, maybe we in the next project, we want to expand our set of goals to make it more fit into the solution space. And finally, how confident, what is the rigor, what is the extent of our evidence that we have 
to ground, to provide confidence in the design knowledge we've created. So if you look at those three dimensions, and I'm not gonna go into this in detail. If you look at the paper, you'll see that. Um, we talk about a journey where either your team or maybe uh, there's a multiple set of uh, you know, project teams here, but we start at one point, say, you know, one situated uh, company, maybe just a small set of bounded you know, goals that we set, but we have a ton of confidence. So two dimensions, the dimension here is fitness, the dimension here is projectability, and how much we've colored in the circles is our level of confidence. Um, so a lot of confidence, but not a lot of projectability, not a lot of fitness. So if we extend it to maybe multiple uh, sites of our organization, maybe we increase the projectability at the same level of fitness, but across maybe multiple sites, we don't have quite the level of confidence that we had. Now, maybe we extend in the next project, we increase from say just utility to maybe security and usability. So it's a more fit project analysis, maybe again, just in one company. And again, maybe our confidence is lower and you can see where I'm going with this. Uh, you know, greater fitness, greater projectability, same confidence, and then maybe we reduce the fitness, but with a higher level of projectability. So you can see the journey that we would do as we reuse previous projects design knowledge. So if you look at the different directions here in that sort of, this shows a two-dimensional space, but you could expand it to the three-dimensional space also. Um, you could actually argue that any of those directions would make sense. Um, uh, particularly, you know, even going backwards makes sense because you've got a dancing landscape. So that landscape may have changed on you. But in the paper itself, we talk about four directions uh, and we actually give them titles uh, as to where you might want to go with your next project based upon your existing knowledge. Okay, so these are the four movements we talk about in the paper. Uh, I'm not gonna go through those in detail with you right now, uh, but they're all appropriate ways of extending existing research into new areas of your problem space, new areas of your solution space, and new ways of building greater confidence in the results that you're producing. So the final part of that paper is just to say, how do we use uh, these ideas uh, for each project to position its current level of knowledge? How do we ground based upon uh, our past projects, our current state of the knowledge base? Uh, how do we argue and align our project about what we wanna to try to accomplish in this project? And then how do we demonstrate that we have advanced uh, prior design knowledge with our new uh, contributions. Okay, so those are the six major challenges. I know I've gone through them fairly quickly. I, I hope I've challenged you to think about all those ideas a little further. Uh, let me just end by talking about three more uh, again, giving you a little bit of overload here, but uh, areas that I think we need to think about research uh, in. And I've talked about this a little bit and that is collaboration. How do we bring the human element, the human values, uh, the human capabilities, uh, the human diversity uh, into good design? Um, I, I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity here to do this type of research in understanding the collaborative emergence of good design from a uh, high, highly functioning design team. Uh, the next area that I, I'm really interested in exploring, I'm just getting a good start here. You can see uh, Shirley and I had a, uh, a paper in uh, SIGFIL uh, at last year's ICIS in Munich, is to understand how big data, data analytics, 
and design science come together. And I think a key idea here is causality. Um, you know, if we can understand ideas of causality, I think that helps us under, understand design theory is why a design artifact creates a cause and effect relationship. And how do we sort of understand the reasoning, inductive, deductive, abductive reasoning uh, in this building of both data artifacts and causal models? Um, I think there's a lot of work that can be done there in that space. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to mention a, uh, a paper again, Shirley and I did that just, just got published like last month where we brought together design science research and digital innovation. Uh, this was uh, appeared in information management, uh, envisioning entrepreneurship and digital innovation through a design science research lens. Um, and the point of that paper was to say, Given our knowledge contribution matrix, where there are four quadrants, we think innovation and entrepreneurship it, it has a different meaning in each of those four quadrants. Um, and by the way, I've got a quote here from a recent paper that did a survey of the digital innovation field. Uh, and they said, a gap is how design science fits into this field. So without going through this in detail, here was sort of our DSRDI digital innovation process model. Um, and you can see here's the problem space, here's our knowledge bases. Um, bringing in this idea of entrepreneurial roles with different uh, means and aspirations. And then understanding, and this is sort of the main, one of the main contributions here is which of the knowledge innovation matrix strategies are you uh, applying in this particular project? Are you in invention, exaptation, advancement or improvement, or exploitation or routine design? And given that, it sort of defines a different type of digital innovation with different practices. Uh, but we still do design and evaluate. So take a look at that paper and you'll see our goals. Um, and one of the issues here is this idea of ambidextrous entrepreneurship, where organizations that have a portfolio, I think need to recognize that their projects are different. They have different practices, different ways of performing the innovation based upon whether it's in the invention quadrant, exaptation quadrant, advancement quadrant, or exploitation quadrant. So we try to make that argument uh, in the paper. Um, so take a look if, you, if you're interested in that space. Final slide. So I hope my talk today has uh, convinced you that good design science research is very interesting, it's exciting, it's important. Uh, it supports rigorous and relevant engaged scholarship. It brings the practitioners into our world. Uh, it bridges the activities of science and technology in interesting and rigorous ways. Uh, it makes clear impacts both in practice as well as in theory. Um, and I've gone through fairly quickly uh, a set of challenges in a little bit of detail and just quickly mention some other exciting uh, opportunities here. So let me uh, end with a final quotation. And challenge you to, uh, I guess, live a daring life by doing good design science research. Okay. Let me open it up to questions. Um, uh, I know we started late, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to stick around a little bit and answer any questions you might have. So thank you for your attention. Uh, we thank you very much for your talk. It's fantastic. Uh, we have like uh, 15 minutes for, uh, for talking. Uh, we have a lot of questions. I will start with Marcelo, Marcelo Chibau. Marcelo. Can you? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Havner. It's a real pleasure to talk to you. 
Well, uh, my question uh, regards uh, the first part of uh, your presentation when you mentioned it, uh, DSR concerning to solve uh, real world problems and the same time helping to advance science. Uh, one of, one of uh, uh, the ways to, to do this advancement is uh, through the advancement of theories, uh, human behavior theories, for example, that you uh, use it to ground the development of your artifact. So my, my question is, uh, uh, what are your tips uh, regarding the, uh, uh, how to use DSR to uh, advance theories? Is it connected to those uh, DSR guidelines? Uh, guidelines number six, for example, is uh, designed as a search process uh, or is connected throughout the whole of the DSR process? But yeah, most of the tips. Yeah, we, we addressed that in our 2013 paper. And there's a couple of figures, but let me just uh, jump down to uh, a figure that I showed toward the end here. And that is perhaps this figure right here. Um, yes, in your project, you know, your literature review, you, you know, as you understand your problem space, you would draw from existing descriptive theory as well as prescriptive theory to say, I need to understand my problem space and model it appropriately uh, you know, to do my, my research. So yes, you draw from what some people call kernel theory or grounding theory to say, this is the way my problem space works. These are the natural laws of my problem space, which is descriptive theory. Um, and then you can say, okay, what existing design knowledge do I have for my problem space? You know, maybe it's a, if you will, a, a search algorithm or a recommendation algorithm. Well, these exist and some people have studied them, but you have a more creative idea of how to do it better. So you've got to at least demonstrate that you know the existing theory, that if appropriate, you're grounding your work on existing theory, but then you move to the next level, to understanding and building new innovative uh, artifacts, and then maybe building and growing new design theory around your artifact and the way it makes improvement. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, totally. Thank you very much. Okay. So we have a, the, the next question was made on YouTube. So I, I, I'll try to translate it. It's from a professor uh, from my university, Mariano Pimentel. Uh, he, he asked if um, having measures is a, it's only a way to do a, a research as a positivist. In, and if you uh, consider the possibility to do uh, research using the uh, DSR, uh, um, sorry, uh, if you consider also doing uh, qualitative research using the DSR. Okay, let me make sure I understand. You said positivist research? Yes. Okay. Uh, it, yeah. Okay, well, uh, you know, I've had that question a lot, and that goes back to our uh, um, evaluation methods. Um, DSR is a research paradigm. It's not a research technique. We apply very many different research techniques as part of our design research project. So as we decide what evaluation techniques to use, um, it could fall under a positivist approach, or you know, it could be a qualitative approach. So we're in some sense agnostic to exactly the types of evaluation methods and techniques you're using. Uh, it's up to you as a good researcher to say, I need to provide evidence for my improvement. And what type of evidence do I, ha I have access to? You know, can I do a controlled study? Uh, you know, can I do something very rigorous? Or do I need to do more of a case study, a qualitative study? Um, you know, maybe a focus group, which is a, a qualitative technique that I've used in a number of projects. So, you know, Yes, you can use positivist methods if it's appropriate to demonstrating the quality and effectiveness of your artifact. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question from YouTube. It's from João Pedro. 
um, he asks, how do behavioral research works uh, in neuroscience applied to computing? Okay, did you, you mentioned neuroscience or neuroIS. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, we, we thought about that. Most neuroIS work right now is behavioral. Uh, we, we try to, uh, you know, gather data to say, how does the uh, cognitive function, the brain waves, if you will, work when we uh, deal with things like trust or acceptance, technology acceptance? My argument, and I make it in the paper that I mentioned, is that that doesn't really apply to design. There's a whole different set of cognitive uh, capabilities that we as humans have in being creative in design and being reasoning in deciding, you know, which of our designs do we implement is the best. So uh, I would say design science research leads to study of different neuroscience techniques than behavioral science does. Now, as we evaluate our artifact, yes, we use behavioral science neuro IS techniques, but the creative design is sort of a different ball game. And that's why, you know, as I talked about um, this figure right here, you know, I would say designing deals with our human ca capabilities of dealing with complexity, creativity, control, and collaboration. So uh, I'd like to see more research in the neurospace on those elements of design. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have another question from Pimentel, uh, from Mariana Pimentel. Uh, he asks about la laboratory evaluations. If it's uh, a good thing to do uh, laboratory evaluations, or if it's or, or if you are only simulating a real environment. Uh, again, it's 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 how you can. It's the let's say the resources that you have to do good evaluation. Uh, and again, as you do your design, uh, refinement, uh, build, evaluate cycles very rapidly, uh, you know, in your solution space, uh, you're going to be identifying different evaluations here that you have more control over. So, for example, if you're building a software system, you're going to be doing software testing. Uh, you're going to do maybe do some more rigorous uh, analytic types of evaluation of your uh, software system. Uh, somebody, a talk I gave, I gave last week said, well, how does computer science differ from information systems? And this is one of the answers I gave is that computer science, most of their projects are very focused on narrow uh, abilities, you know, uh, capabilities of the artifact in optimization, performance, uh, you know, uh, ways of, you know, uh, being very efficient. Whereas we in information systems, our goals are more human-based goals. You know, the socio-technical goals of uh, usability, security, uh, you know, effectiveness. And so we build on uh, goals that are sort of at the lower levels of the hierarchy here. But in socio-technical information systems uh, projects, we're more looking at sort of improvements in higher levels in the, of the hierarchy here. So, uh, you know, again, it's a complex, challenging environment, but we in IS, we deal with some of these higher level uh, objectives and goals. Uh, computer science is probably more focused on the more technical utilitarian types of goals, but we all work together here. So we have to understand the technical components. And I think the computer science community has to appreciate the work that we do at the higher levels of these hierarchies. Okay. Uh, another one, uh, also from Pimentel. <laughs> uh, he's concerned about the process of doing uh, design science research. Uh, if, um, oh, sorry, I lost. Um, he asks if instead of saying that uh, design science research is a, a research method uh, with uh, steps that we have to follow, 
uh, if you are saying that, uh, sorry, that you are saying that we have we have a, a set of activities and not a set of activity in that order. Yeah, yeah you know that. I think that goes back to um, you know our, our understanding of of what a good process is, and the existing processes are, are very good. I mean. Uh, I've used the PEFRS methodology to define my process. I've used the SEND methodology to define my process. Uh, but I think, to, again, depending upon your problem space, it's very appropriate to think about, okay, how do I stage these activities? You know, diagnosis, design, implementation, and evolution. And I'm very much influenced. Uh, you know, I come from computer science, software engineering world. And the whole world of agile development has changed that space significantly over the last 20 years. I think we need to apply the same ideas of agility and rapid design and, uh, you know, intervention in our projects, too. You know, if we're going to fail, let's fail fast. Understand why and get back and, and do it right. So these rapid cycles here, I think, are very critical for us to think through uh, in our projects, you know, as I talk to doctoral students and DBA students, um, you know, I I like to structure their project as say three cycles of design and or diagnosis, two cycles of design, two cycles of implementation. Uh, let's get in there and let's do it, and then let's build. Let's appropriately ground theory, but then let's build new design theory about what we're learning as we perform these emergent tasks. Okay, thanks. Th that one I like that uh, as a software engineering, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so I have a, a question uh, for myself as well. Uh, how do I know that I'm doing design science research wrong? Wrongly? Yes. <laughs> well, Is there a way? <laughs> Sometimes I see why well, I'm just uh, doing uh, lots of case studies and not design science. Uh, yeah. how, how do I know I, I'm wrong? <laughs> well, I would go back to these guidelines uh, and say, okay, if I'm not at least addressing each of these seven guidelines, I'm doing something wrong or I'm not doing enough in my project. Uh, and the key to me, you know, I look at people's projects all the time um, and they're asking me, what am I missing? Am I doing design science? I guess my first question is that guideline number one, what is your artifact? If you can't articulate an artifact to me, then you're probably not doing design science. Now you may be, but you're not understanding your artifact. And that's why where you might need some mentorship or some support. Um, I guess the other one that I would jump at is how do you eventually plan to make two sp very clear research contributions to practice and to theory. Again, people may say, hey, I'm building this nice algorithm that you know, my colleagues in practice are going to use. But then I would ask, okay, but what is your research contribution? What is your design theory that you're trying to build around this new idea? Um, and again, they struggle with that. So, you know, again, each one of these seven guidelines, you could say, Hey, if you're not, if you don't understand how you're meeting that guideline, you may not be doing design science research. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, the last question is from uh, Flavio Rita, and he he will he will end the, the presentation. So, Flavio, can you ask Havner? And uh, again, Professor Havner, we all thank you very much. Flavio. Hi, Ala. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. It's really good to have you here. And uh, before I finish the session, I would like to uh, make a short question, actually. Uh, yes, I used these guidelines a lot in my PhD, okay? So it's a very, uh, it was very useful. Uh, I have to say that without these guidelines, I would not have finished my PhD at all, you know? So thank you, thank you very much for publishing it, for, uh, you know, for writing this paper and also the, the, the new, the, the new, I think is the new one.
from uh, with Gregor in 2013, which is also very line to full clarified a lot of, uh, of the doubts that I have uh, while I was doing my PhD as well. So thank you very much for all this work. And my question is, uh, why did you come up with the guidelines in 2004? Because I think that, uh, okay, it's like, uh, in my opinion, uh, I think I, I, I used to start from the method. So you can, you, when you're talking about design science, uh, I usually try to understand what is the steps you have to follow to develop the, the, the artifact itself. And uh, why guidelines in the, it was the first, you know, the first paper. Uh, that's that's more like like a curiosity uh, instead of like a real question, you know? No, no, it's a, it's a real question. And uh, you know, quickly, let me give you a little historical perspective uh, yeah. in that, you know, it took us six years to get that paper published. Uh, we started writing it about 97, 98. Uh, it didn't get published until 2004. And part of that was the real ongoing discussion among the IS community, uh, both the technical side and the behavioral side, uh, where there were very different ideas about, you know, how to present, if you will, technical research as legitimate to the information systems community. Um, so along the way, you know, we did have discussions of, you know, should we present a process model? And we decided not to because there were a couple out there already, uh, in particular, the Nunnemaker model, uh, some work by Vashnavi and Kuchler, um, and some, some other papers. Um, so we decided instead of a process model, uh, we decided that the process itself, while important, wasn't a new contribution. People understood how to do process. And so we didn't think we were going to make a new contribution there. Uh, but what we felt was that people needed some guidance to say, what is good design science research? So we felt that we, made it, we were making a bigger contribution by providing guidelines that answered that question rather than a process model. Now, other colleagues, as you can see, the Peffers et al., including my good colleague, uh, Samir Chatterjee, felt that maybe, yeah, there was a need to provide a process model. Um, I'm almost uh, agnostic to process models. Uh, I think the elaborated one that I showed you here is appropriate, uh, but everybody could design their own process model and it would be right. There's no one right process model. So enough said. <laughs> yeah, it's true, it's true. It's a, good, it's a very good point. It's a very good point because you depends on the work that you're doing, you know, because uh, for example, the action design research is another method or process that I used a lot. Uh, I try, at least try to use the lot uh, while I was doing the PhD. But this new paper that you published last year or this year, if I'm not wrong, uh, pointing the directions about what is the start, the, the entering point is a really good one as well, because uh, I found a little bit lost when I'm trying to apply design, uh, the action design research. And every time you, you when you read design's paper uh, from 2013, they start with the problem uh, statement. And it was like, yeah, but they already have the, the system working, you know? So how can you get into the business or the organization or the corporation? And then you start to ask, what is the problem? Let's model the problem, but they already have some systems. Uh, and it's very interesting that uh, now we, I kind of understand from this process, uh, from this new E uh, action design, research, this elaborated action design research, that you have different uh, entry points. That's that's a very good one as well. So uh, thank you very much for this paper, as well. Okay. And yeah, well, I was going to say thank thank you for the opportunity to give the talk, and I hope would really hope and have the opportunity to meet all of you when I come to Brazil, and I, I'd like to do that as soon as we have the ability to to do it. So uh, uh, look forward to meeting all of you in person eventually. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, really, really good presentation. I think that everybody was here. We got uh, 200 people in the topic of uh, combining YouTube and also uh, also Zoom uh, room. So it was a lot of people listening to you and uh, I'm sh quite sure that a lot of people also get to know design science and I'm sure that they will find a light on the method 
and uh, they could finish their PhD as I did three years ago. It was really good. Thank you very much, Havner. And uh, as well, I think that uh, let's see if in the upcoming years we can, you can come to Brazil, visit, uh, actually put in action the plan that we planted uh, for March of, of this year. Okay. Thank you very much again. We look forward to it. Thank you. And stay in touch. Thank you all. Thank you.